Welcome to another movie plot. Enjoy the memories and watch out for spoilers. It takes place at the landing site Acidalia Planitia on the red surface of Mars, with botanist Mark Watney collecting soil samples on his 18th day since arrival. Inside their surface-mounted habitat station the flight surgeon Chris is alerted to a severe storm approaching by the system's operator Beth. Their navigator Vogel's the first to notice it from the ground so the team regroup inside where their well-respected commander Melissa speculates their next move. Vogel and Watney suggest waiting it out, but with a chance of the shuttle tipping in the storm Melissa gives the orders to prep for an emergency departure. The cruise pilot Martinez is waiting for them on board, as they're blasted in the face with heavy winds while making their way through the sandstorm. Suddenly a piece of debris strikes Watney knocking him out of sight and deactivating his biosensors. Melissa tries find him and even remains inside the storm once the others are safe on board the Ares 3, but with the vessel beginning to list she returns without him to their maiden vessel sitting in orbit above them the Hermes spacecraft. On Earth the director of NASA Ted holds a press conference to state that the crew are returning after being forced to abandon their mission. Mark's declared dead to the public but wakes up alone on Mars with his oxygen rapidly depleting. He makes it back to the habitat station and painfully removes his space suit as a piece of metal still lodged in his abdomen. Using the abandoned medical gear he's able to remove the shard and staple it up before passing out. Some time later he wakes up and begins a video log from day 19 stating that he's still alive, although he's now living in a bungalow built to last only 31 days. He's determined not to die and with the food supply meant for the whole Hermes crew he'll have almost a year's worth if he rations it. Mark's next task is to remove all the equipment from the habitat and turn it into a plot capable of farming hundreds of potatoes, using his own feces which has been kept freeze-dried and almost kills him with the fumes. Mars comes to fear Watney's botany powers as he's able to get three years worth of potatoes growing on a planet where nothing grows. His biggest problem is that the soil needs too much water to remain fertile, but Mark knows the recipe for creating water which is a practice long avoided by NASA, since fire makes everybody die in space. He takes the leftover hydrazine from the abandoned thrusters then separates the hydrogen from it by running it over iridium, then sets it on fire in a confined space to create condensation forming on the walls. His first attempt nearly blows him apart when he forgets to equate the extra oxygen due to five less crew members. Eventually he gets it working, and overnight the crops are gradually watered and potato plants begin to sprout. Meanwhile on Earth a funeral is held for Mark Watney, and director of NASA Mars missions Vincent talks to Teddy about sending a satellite up to check on the state of Acidalia Planitia. Ted's worried that an image of Mark's body could look bad for them to the public, but Vincent reminds him that remains don't decay on Mars and Watney will lay there forever, but meteorologists have predicted that the corpse will be covered by sand within a year and that's when Ted says they'll check. Shortly after that revealing conversation, an engineer named Mindy's working late and discovers from satellite photos taken minutes apart that there's movement on the surface of Mars. She meets with Vincent and Teddy but they still have 10 months until the rest of Mark's crew get back to Earth. Ted doesn't want to tell them that Mark's alive and determines that he'll starve to death before anyone can rescue him anyway. While Vincent speculates on what kind of hell Mark must be going through, the director of media relations Annie sets up a press hearing to release a statement, where Teddy's immediately asked by the media if he intends to retire after such a large blunder. It'll be another four years before the next Ares mission reaches Mars, so Mark intends to hitch a ride back to Earth from the Schiaparelli landing site on the other side of the planet. On day 70 he makes preparations for the journey by retrieving an extra battery from a damaged rover to use in the working one. Since he'll also need the solar cells for extra power and the nights are freezing cold, he solves this by digging up a vat of plutonium waste that's been discarded beneath the surface, and puts the decaying radioactive isotope in the cabin with him to stay warm. NASA determines that they could reach Watney with another shuttle if he can survive for over two years, since it'll take Bruce and his team at the Jet Propulsion Lab roughly three months to even build the thruster. Ted puts Mindy in charge of getting more footage over the Red Planet and the flight director Mitch keeps wanting them to inform the rest of Watney's crew that he's alive. 48 days after planning them Mark has more than enough fresh potatoes to last him until rescue, now's just the trouble of finding creative ways to eat them. The next day Watney takes the rover to locate a pathfinder that NASA previously abandoned on the planet after a failure. He brings it back to the habitat and is able to get in touch with Vincent who's now at the JPL with Bruce. Through a series of photos with a half an hour delay his first concern is for his team's reputation, before setting up hexadecimal numbering around the pathfinder so that they can communicate back with the camera. The director broadcasts Mark's messages across the world as his phenomenal story is watched by millions, but the first thing he asks is how did the crew take the news of his survival. Vincent regretfully informs him that the crew still has no idea, causing Watney to broadcast his disdain through profanity across the globe, which is hated by NASA's publicists but enjoyed by his friends. 
It's been four months since the crew aboard the Hermes left Mars, and they've been kept from contacting their families on Earth until they've complete their mission. Mitch contacts them with the terrible news that they've known for two months without telling them, which only makes them more guilt-ridden as Melissa takes responsibility as the commander for abandoning Mark. He's officially colonized a new planet and conveys his happiness back to Earth, but one night when he enters the habitat, the airlock decompresses causing an explosion that destroys a good portion of the facility. Mark survives by using duct tape to seal the crack in his helmet but the crops are completely devastated by the sub-zero temperatures. After clearing out the debris and patching up the habitat enough to allow him to breathe again, now Mark's only got enough rations to last him if he starves himself for the most part. So NASA allow the Hermes crew to speak to him regularly on their trip home while scrambling to launch a supply probe in the meantime. They push Bruce harder than ever to put it together in 15 days, and expect it to reach Mars with enough food for Mark to wait until the next mission arrives. After an initial successful launch that sees the whole agency cheering, the rocket veers off course and explodes over some poor farmer's house. With a sense of impending doom, Mark asks Melissa to relay a message to his parents if he doesn't make it, that he loved what he died doing and that it was all for a purpose greater than himself. Meanwhile in China Deputy Tao from their National Space Admin sees the probe explode on the news, and informs the chief scientist Ming that they have thrusters capable of saving the American themselves, but also that no one will know if they keep it a secret. Despite it setting their own agency behind Ming decides to get on the phone to Teddy who delivers the good news to NASA. One of NASA's promising young astrodynamicists Rich, devises a plan to get the supplies and even a rescue team to Mars quicker than expected. They conduct a meeting to retrieve Mark that Mitch appropriately names Project Elrond due to its secrecy. Rich explains his code that'll allow the Hermes to collect the supply probe, pick up Mark, and reduce its journey back to Earth by slingshotting themselves around the Red Planet. This would require Mark to reach the other landing site a few months journey in the rover away, and use the ascent vehicle intended for the next Ares mission to launch himself into space for collection. Ted finds this all too risky for the lives of the other crew members getting him called a coward by Mitch, who goes on to send Beth the plans for their comrade's extraction in secret anyway. Despite knowing that it'll add 19 months to their time away from their families, the crew all vote to return and save Mark by hijacking the Hermes and disabling NASA's ability to override their commands. Because of this Mitch is forced by Ted to resign once everything's over, but he still travels to China where they have a successful probe launch that's scooped up by the Hermes in space. They go rescue their botanist who's currently performing all of their failed tasks in the meantime that they were forced to abandon when leaving. Vincent and Mark simultaneously begin running tests to find out the best way to get him into orbit without exploding, and after a total of 461 days on Mars, Mark's lost a lot of weight and has told Mindy that he wishes to be called Captain Blondbeard. Since nobody gave him explicit permission to take the craft into space, he dubs himself a space pirate and begins the months-long journey to the other side of the planet for extraction. 33 days later and the batteries are beginning to run dry with the solar panels struggling to keep up with demand. The team at NASA are informed by Bruce that the only way to get Mark into orbit is if he removes half the paneling on the Ares 4 Ascension vehicle and launches it into space just covered with a plastic sheet. After 77 days of traversing Mars, Watney finally reaches the Ascension vehicle at the Schiaparelli crater. He removes all of the panels as they talked about while Martinez practices on simulations of the intercept but continuously misses the small window. After the shuttles fitted with the sheet only expected to last long enough to burn up instead of Mark, he eats the last potatoes that he's ever going to eat and leaves a note inside the rover about how it saved his life. As the country tunes in to witness the occasion, Mark makes himself presentable and puts on his spacesuit. The Hermes glides overhead and Martinez remotely launches their comrade into orbit with the blanket doing its job well. Mark briefly passes out giving concern to everyone watching at home, but he soon regains consciousness and gets back on the radio. Calculations are slightly off and the Hermes is coming in too fast to make a smooth pickup, so Melissa revises their current plan with the new one of blowing up part of their ship to slow them down without wasting fuel on the thrusters. The crew work together with Vogel making a homemade bomb, and Beth running it down to Chris to plan on the outside of the ship. When he returns he finds the commander gearing up as she intends to go out herself and try to reach Mark with a tether attached to the Hermes. The ascension vehicle falls short of the intended distance and she's never going to reach him, so Mark makes the risky maneuver of puncturing a hole in his spacesuit to propel himself through space toward her. He misses but manages to grab hold of the tether before floating off into the void, and pulls himself towards the first human that he's seen in years as the whole of the viewing world celebrates. Sometime later the survivor starts his first day as an instructor to aspiring astronauts. He tells them that if things ever go bad that they can either accept their fate or work toward fixing it to come home. Then when told to ask him a question they all raise their hand as they only want to know about Mars. 
the credits roll and we see the successful launch of Ares 5 with Martinez returning to the Red Planet, as the rest of the crew watch from their homes or offices, or hospitals where Chris and Beth welcome their first child into the world. And the movie ends.